what I'm about to say for many of you is going to revolutionize your faith. It's going to take your faith and your knowledge of the scriptures to another whole level. I'm going to say things you probably never heard before. I'm going to start by talking about Cain and Abel, and then I'm going to get into what the scriptures really say about atonement, and it will shock many of you. Proverbs chapter 18 verse 13 says, if you answer a matter before you hear the whole matter, it is foolishness. It is folly. So stick around until the end and make sure you hear this whole thing because what I'm about to say, especially later on, is going to cause some of you to go, oh, wait a minute now, wait a minute. You're probably tempted to do a little bit of comments that's not going to be very positive. You're tempted to just say enough of this and just walk away without hearing me out. Hear me out. First John chapter 3 verse 11. For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. Notice the sequence of events here. First, Cain sinned. His actions were evil. Abel did what was right. His actions were righteous. And because Cain sinned and Abel did not, Cain got jealous of Abel and killed him. So first, Cain sinned, then he murdered his brother. But how did Cain sin? In that same book, in that same chapter, just back up seven verses, it gives you the definition of sin. 1 John chapter 3, verse 4, Whosoever commits sin transgresses also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. So how did Cain sin? Well, he transgressed the law. He broke the law. He disobeyed God. But how did Cain disobey God? How did Cain transgress the law? Let's read it. Genesis chapter 4 verse 2. Now Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. That term, his countenance fell, is just an old way of saying he was sad. Verse 6, So the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? In other words, why are you sad? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door. And its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. So it says that Abel brought the firstborn of the flock and of their fat. Not just any old offering of the flock, but the firstborn. And the fat symbolizes richness. So Abel gave the best of the best. But in verse 3, it says that Cain brought an offering of the fruit. It doesn't say the first fruits. It could have been the worst part of the crop. It could have been the blemished fruit or the deformed fruit. So again, you might ask, what law did Cain break? Because doesn't it say in Romans chapter 4, verse 15, because the law brings about wrath and where there is no law, there is no transgression. And in Romans chapter 5, verse 13, it says, sin is not counted against anyone when there is no law. But obviously, Cain had sin counted against him. God rejected him. God rejected his offering. God did not accept him. God even labeled it as sin when he was talking to Cain afterward. But some of you would say, well, God didn't give the law then. Well, how could he have sinned? And this is where you need to realize that God's word includes God's law. And according to Psalm 119 verse 89, God's word is eternal, timeless. There's no beginning to it. There's no ending of it. It was here before the foundation of the world. It will be here after the world is done. The word of God is eternal. And that word obviously includes God's law. It's a basic principle. A law is a reflection of a lawgiver. If a lawgiver changes, then the laws change. And in this circumstance, we know that the lawgiver does not change. It's no coincidence that at the end of the so-called Old Testament of the Protestant Bible, Malachi chapter 3, God said very clearly, I am the Lord, I change not. 
And his law is a reflection of him. He said, don't commit adultery because he doesn't commit adultery. He said, don't bear false witness because he don't bear false witness. God's law is eternal because God is eternal. Did you know that over 40 times in the books of Moses, that it says that the principles of his laws, the precepts of his laws, the ordinances of his laws are perpetual, eternal to all generations forever. God's law existed long before Moses was even born. It's just that when Moses came, he took that law and he wrote it down. He made that law incorporated into a theocracy of a nation. Just because Moses didn't actually write it down, just because it wasn't engraved in stone here on earth, doesn't mean that it didn't exist in heaven. Just because Moses didn't inscribe the law in stone, doesn't mean that the law did not exist, at least in the heavenly realms. And we see evidence that God's law, the same law that Moses wrote down, existed before, long before Moses was even born. You might say, what is that evidence? Look at the life of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Job, and Noah. They all performed sacrifices in exactly the same way that the law of Moses prescribed. You think that's a coincidence? And it goes beyond sacrifices and offerings. Look how Noah differentiated between the clean and the unclean animals long before Moses came around. How did Cain and Abel and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Job and Noah know about these laws? They, by faith, tapped into the law of God. They had the heavenly vision. They knew the law of God before Moses wrote it down on stone. Because the law of God is eternal. Because God is eternal. So what law did Cain break? Deuteronomy chapter 18 verse 4. The first fruits of your grain and your new wine and your oil and the first of the fleece of your sheep you shall give him. Leviticus chapter 2 verse 12. As an offering of first fruits you shall bring them to the Lord. Exodus chapter 23 verse 19, bring the best of the first fruits of your soil to the house of the Lord your God. Numbers 18 12, all the best of the oil and all the best of the wine and of the wheat, the first fruits of them which they shall offer unto the Lord, them have I given thee. Cain transgressed this law. On the flip side, what law did Abel obey? Numbers chapter 18 verse 17, but the firstling of a cow, or the firstling of a sheep, or the firstling of a goat, thou shalt not redeem. They are holy. Thou shalt sprinkle their blood upon the altar, and shall burn their fat for an offering made by fire, for a sweet savor unto the Lord. Abel did exactly that. He brought the firstborn of the flock with their fat. For those of you who are still not convinced that Cain actually transgressed the law of God, I ask you one question. How can you differentiate between an evil action, which Cain did, and a righteous action, which Abel did, without a law to tell you what's right and what's wrong? And that law did not come from willy-nilly. It came from God. And we know that because willy-nilly wasn't offended at it. It was God that was offended at it. But one of the most popular theories about why God rejected Cain and accepted Abel is because Cain didn't bring a blood sacrifice. And that theory does not hold water for three reasons. One, Cain was a tiller of the soil. He dealt with fruits, vegetables, grains. He did not possess livestock. Why would God demand that he bring something that he does not possess? And as you'll see in point number three, God just does not work that way. Number two, why would God harshly condemn and curse Cain for bringing produce and then turn around later and command his people to bring produce later in the Torah? It doesn't make sense. And number three, this is the biggie. Before I tell you this, I'm going to have to warn you, this is going to go against a lot of your theology, a lot of your doctrine, but it is the truth according to the scriptures, and I will show you. Remember, hear me out before you judge me, before you turn me off, hear me out to the end. In the Torah, it says clearly that you could obtain atonement without blood. And I know many of you are going to say, but it says in Hebrews 9.22 that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. But let's read it in context. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 21 to 22. Moreover, he, 
that is, the priest, sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And almost all things, things, not people, are by the law purged with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. In context, it's talking about things, not people. Another passage of scripture that people love to quote to prove that blood is necessary for atonement is Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11. But let's read that one in context. Starting at Leviticus chapter 17, verse 10. And whatsoever man there be of the house of Israel or of the strangers that sojourn among you that eateth, that eateth, eats any matter of blood, I will even set my face against that soul that eats blood and will cut him off from among his people. And here's the verse that people love to take out of context. Verse 11, for the life of the flesh is in the blood and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. Verse 12. Therefore I said unto the children of Israel, No soul of you shall eat blood, neither shall any stranger that sojourns among you eat blood. And whatsoever man there be of the children of Israel, or of the strangers that sojourn among you, which hunts and catches any beast or fowl that may be eaten, he shall even pour out the blood thereof and cover it with dust. For it is the life of all flesh, the blood of it is for the life thereof. Therefore I said unto the children of Israel, You shall eat the blood of no manner of flesh, for the life of all flesh is the blood thereof. Whosoever eats it shall be cut off, and every soul that eats that which dies of itself, or that which is torn with beasts, whether it be one of your own country or a stranger, he shall both wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until evening. Then shall he be clean. But if he wash them not nor bathe his flesh, then he shall bear his iniquity. Notice two things about this passage. Number one, in context, it's about diet. It's about what you eat. It's not about atonement. Leviticus 17.11 is couched in the idea of diet. And number two, it says an atonement. It doesn't say the only means of atonement. And I will prove it to you. A favorite among many Christians, 2 Chronicles 7, 14, God said, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Where's the blood there? This is promising forgiveness without blood in the so-called Old Testament. So according to this passage, what is required for forgiveness? One, to humble yourself. Two, to pray. Three, to seek God's face. And four, to turn from your wicked ways. To boil it down even further, you can say, pray and repent. That's all God said to do in order to obtain forgiveness. Pray and repent. Prayer and repentance. And then there's another question. What if the children of Israel have no access to the temple? What if the temple is destroyed? Or what if they're carried away captive to another land, which happened time and time again? Does that mean that they are completely cut off from forgiveness, from atonement? No. 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 46 to 50 tell us how they got atonement for sins, forgiveness of sins, without blood. Verse 46, when they, that is the children of Israel, sin against you, for there is no one who does not sin, and you become angry with them and deliver them to the enemy, and they take them captive to the land of the enemy, far or near, yet when they come to themselves in the land where they were carried captive and repent and make supplication, there we go, prayer and repentance again. So if they repent and make supplication, in other words, pray to you, that is God, in the land of those who took them captive, saying, we have sinned and done wrong, we have committed wickedness, and when they return to you with all their heart and with all their soul in the land of their enemies who led them away captive and pray to you toward their land, which you gave to their fathers, the city which you have chosen and the temple which I have built for your name, then hear in heaven your dwelling place, their prayer and their supplication and maintain their cause and forgive your people who have sinned against you and all their transgressions which they have transgressed against you and grant them compassion before those who took them captive that they may have compassion on them. 
There we go again in the so-called Old Testament. All you need is prayer and repentance for forgiveness. And the scriptures don't stop there. I'm going to show you from the Torah and from the book of Acts. Check this out. Exodus chapter 30 verse 15. The rich shall not give more and the poor shall not give less than half a shekel when you give an offering to the Lord to make atonement for yourselves. And you shall take the atonement money of the children of Israel and shall appoint it for the service of the tabernacle of meeting that it may be a memorial Highlight that word in your mind, memorial for the children of Israel before the Lord to make atonement for yourselves. So we see that giving makes atonement for your soul and gives you a memorial before the Lord. And get this, that concept is also found in the book of Acts. When Cornelius met the angel, Acts chapter 10 verse 4, Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord, he asked. The angel answered, your prayers, prayers, and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Memorial offering? That's a fulfillment of Exodus chapter 30, verses 15 and 16 in Cornelius. That is applicable, obviously, to the book of Acts New Testament church. And if you're still not convinced, here's a question for you. If you still believe that you absolutely need that blood in order to obtain atonement, what if you cannot afford to buy that animal to sacrifice it? Does God just say, you're poor, sorry about your luck, you're going to hell? Absolutely not. In Leviticus chapter 5 verses 5 to 10, God clearly says, if you can't afford to buy that lamb for sacrifice, and you know, back in those days and even today, they can be expensive. They can be expensive. If you can't afford to do that, it says, buy two turtle doves or two young pigeons and use those for sacrifice. And we see that Mary, the mother of Jesus, did exactly that in Luke chapter 2 verse 24. Apparently, Joseph and Mary could not afford to buy a lamb, so they just bought two turtle doves or two young pigeons, as recorded in Luke chapter 2, 24. But what if you are just so poor, you can't afford that either? What if you can't afford to buy two turtle doves or two young pigeons? Leviticus chapter 5, verse 11. But if he is not able to bring two turtle doves or two young pigeons, then he who sinned shall bring for his offering one-tenth of an ephah of fine flour as a sin offering. Where is the blood there? It goes on to say, He shall put no oil on it, nor shall he put frankincense on it, for it is a sin offering. Where's the blood there? And I can just hear somebody make the stupid excuse, well, it says it's a sin offering, but it doesn't say atonement. Read on there, buddy. Leviticus chapter 5, verse 12. Then he shall bring it, that is the flower, to the priest, and the priest shall take his handful of it as a memorial portion and burn it on the altar according to the offerings made by fire to the Lord. In other words, burn it just like a blood offering. It is a sin offering. The priest shall make atonement for him, for his sin that he has committed in any of these matters, and it shall be forgiven him. So the flower, no blood there, no animal involved, is a sin offering to make atonement for him, and his sin shall be forgiven. So no, Cain didn't need blood. He only needed to bring the best, the first fruits, but he didn't. And that is why he was rejected.